to pray? Let's do it. Father, thank you. We just love you, Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we invite you here. We're talking all things marriage and parenting, things that are near and dear to your heart. And so, Lord, help us as we share. And I just pray, Father, that for all of us, we go out here further equipped to do married life better, to do parenting life better. Father, I pray that there'd just be insight and wisdom that would be unlocked in each of our hearts because we're never too old to learn. And Lord, we just ask you whatever. Um, I know there's so many marriages here for various um, numbers of years. But Lord, for all of us, we can all learn and we can all pursue a great marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So just if you don't mind, how many married couples are in the room? Let me see anyone married. Anybody uh, single again in the room? Any Single again, any, how many, if you don't mind, it's okay, it's, hopefully there's, how many blended families do we have? Like, you know, yep, good, okay, because we want to make sure we know who we're talking to. Um, and what are the, any singles in the room? Anybody here single and ready to mingle? Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, so um, we actually just recently uh, spoke in Richmond. It was only just ah, a few weeks ago, wasn't it, Dale? Mm-hmm. Sorry, that was my thigh. Um, when I push back, um, and it was went really well, didn't it? It did. I think it yeah, did. Anyway, it so did. yeah. Um, and thank you for coming. Honestly, yes. thank you for turning up and just going. You know what? We we want our marriage and our family to be great. And and I just want to say to each one of you, you can have a great marriage. You know, I think sometimes we get fooled into thinking, well, I guess this is as good as it gets. I just don't believe that's what God has for you, at all. Um, Now, it's hard work, okay? So I'm just going to say that up front is it's work. Steve and I have been married 40 years in November. Uh, It's crazy that we can even say that, you know. I know. You're all thinking we don't look that old, right? Yeah. Weren't you? No. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. (laughs) But, um, you know... The thing is, with all of our marriages and wherever you are on the, you know, you might have no children yet. You might have toddlers, elementary age, high school, college. You might be an empty nester. Every season of marriage comes with its own nuances, honestly. And so the thing with all of us is we walk down the aisle to each other and commit ourselves to each other as newly married and recently single people. And then we launch into marriage. And and I would just say to us, we have to stay flexible Mm. because we are constantly changing. I just thought I'd read, first of all, just just as we go into, um, you know, talking about marriage, I just wanted to read this, the scripture out of Ephesians 5, Mm. um, because I just think it lays the ground rules for what God sees as a great marriage. And again, we especially right now have a culture that is very self-oriented. I want to be happy. I don't want to be in pain. You need to make me happy. That's the antithesis of what the scripture teaches. And so I just wanted to read this. Ephesians 5, 21, the Bible says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then Paul goes on and says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, um, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Paul says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church, the mystery. However, 
Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Mm. And I just love that passage of scripture because I believe it lays ground rules. In other words, I'm here for you and you're here for, you know what I mean? Like we are, I, I am committed. Remember when we walked down the aisle and we said, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, till death do us part. We promised we've got your back mm -hmm. every day, every day, every day. Then life hits and we're almost like, wow, mm -hmm. what is going on? So then now Steve and I just wanted to kind of jump in on seasons, but I just wanted to lay the ground rules. I think if we treat our marriages like a living entity, it's, mm -hmm. it's alive. And if we feed it, and if we work on it, if we sow into it, we reap the benefit of it. And if we don't, it just shrivels up and die. Relationships need work. And I just wanna encourage all of us, whatever, you know, you might've walked in here and your marriage is great, and that's so awesome. Yeah. But you might be, you might've walked in here tonight going, this is, this is kind of the last, it's kind of the last straw for us. I just wanna to say to you, there's great hope, yeah. great hope. And you might have friends that are struggling or walking through. There is great hope in Jesus. But the bottom line is we have to die to ourselves <laughs> in following Christ and then in honoring and respecting and loving our spouse. Amen. So the Bible says, Psalm 16, verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart, I love this verse, listen to it. My heart instructs me. In the night seasons, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I got to tell you, there's a lot of ungodly counsel out there. Yes. And yes. we need to make sure our counsel comes from God. Amen. And I love what it says here. And my heart instructs me in the night seasons. So I guess when I talk about marriage, there are seasons in a marriage. Sharon mentioned we've been married 40 years. I got to tell you, there's been seasons like just in nature, summer, except today is the first day of summer, right? Not the best first day of summer today, um, unless you love rain and cold weather. Um, but the truth is, there's summer. There's like sun shining, everything's going well. But there's other seasons like what comes after summer? Fall. And all the fruit's falling off. You know what I mean? And, and it's another season. And it's like all the things that were in bloom now aren't blooming anymore. And that's true in a marriage. And, and, and that's true even spiritually. There's times when you're praying and it feels like before you even pray the prayer, God's answered it. There's other times you feel like you're praying and it, the prayers come out of your mouth and fall to the floor. Um, that, and then there's a winter season. Winter is barren. You know, and all the, all the leaves are gone and things are cold and stark. And, you know, and then, of course, there's spring, which is new life. Well, there's seasons in a marriage. And sometimes your marriage will be summer and sometimes it'll be winter. And, you know, for us, been married 40 years, we've navigated those seasons. And there's also seasons, like Sharon mentioned, about, you know, um, younger, just newlyweds. And, you know, then we went all through that and kids and high school and college. And we're now in the empty nesting phase. We're nowhere near the retirement phase. We still got a lot of vision in us. But we are looking to what life looks like moving forwards for us. And what that'll look like. So there's seasons where all that changes, doesn't it? And if you don't deal, do well with those seasons, you could feel like something's wrong and it's, it's a season. Here's the thought I want to give you. My heart instructs me in the night season, in the, in the dark season. But you've got to make sure the right instructions are in your heart. Because if you wait for the night season and now your heart's going to instruct you and the wrong things are in your heart, then the night season, you're going to get wrong instructions. So you being here tonight is depositing. I, 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 you, you got to forgive me. There is a part of me as a pastor, um, you know, we, we really don't look at the names of who's going to come. We just said we want to do a, a larger community group than normal because we want to speak on this. But I got to tell you, if I could show you over the years of people who've been in my office and our pastor's offices – looking for help and wisdom in their marriage. And then I'm thinking, where are they tonight? Do you know what I mean? They want us to fix it. And I'm not saying they're not here. But I'm just saying, you being here tonight 
is putting the right instructions. So when there is a night season, you've got the right instruction. Your heart will instruct you, but don't wait for the night season to find out what's in your heart. Make sense? Um, so Psalm 1 verse 3, He shall be like a tree. I love this. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. So we're not always pushing out summertime. We're not always in springtime. Sometime, and it says you bear fruit in your season. And it goes, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. But still, even though whatever you do prospers, you've got to understand there's seasons. There's seasons when, you know, you bear fruit in season. You can't always be bearing fruit. You've got to take time to draw nutrients back from the soil. Get, you know, let the tree, you know what I mean, pull up the nutrients from the ground, and you're not always pushing out fruit. So you bear fruit in seasons. And there's sometimes for us, for married life has been great. And there's other times it's been hard. And that's life. And that's just called doing life. So I love what Paul said to Timothy 4 verse 2. Paul says, and I want you to catch this verse for a marriage. He says, and he's talking, the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, the pastor. And he goes, preach the word, be ready, listen, in season and out of season. I love that. It goes, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, there's going to be days when you feel like preaching and there's going to be some days when you don't feel like preaching. But you got to preach the word, be instant. And I want to say in marriages, we've got to be understand there's times when we feel in love and there'll be some times when you don't feel in love. And that's okay. Matter of fact, that's life and that's normal. So uh, you've got to know the season. So the seasons, honey, are single. Single, engaged, married, married with children, and col- oh, married, school, college, emptiness, and retired. And then, well, and well, single again could be another one. Uh, and then there's another season. We, know, we were just helping Joe Riddle. Yeah. And, and Joe Riddle's navigating right now. Sharon was looking after... The kids and Joe was going to banks and trying to change accounts and everything else. And Joe's navigating a very tough season, life without his beautiful girl um, and raising three kids. So um, there you go. Do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, I just wanted to pull out a scripture because I think one of the big challenges that we face in our marriages and in in our families, to be honest, is comparison. I think we um, think it's easier for them. Well, she got that husband or he got that wife. Um, Look at their kids. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. They're just not. And I think, uh, particularly as women, I think, and I think I fell into this trap with little kids. You know, I was around some people who were big money earners when my kids were little and their kids were dressed in, you know, and our kids were not. And I just felt this overwhelming pressure of, oh, my gosh, where now, you know, oh, my gosh, I just can't keep up. And and now that I am 30 odd years down the track, I'm like, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. But unfortunately, our humanity sometimes draws us to focus on the stuff that's not right. You know, now I'm all about all about. We are all about, you know, giving your kids the best education you can give them and all of that. But we can't do it all. We can't. And you've just got to be good with good, with where you are at and the lane you are in Mm -hmm. and the spouse you have. Water that grass, water your marriage and work at it and fertilize it and, and do all that kind of stuff. And I promise you, when you get decades down the track like we are, you look back and go, Thank you, God, that I didn't go off a tangent, you know, focusing on the wrong thing. Comparison is a big thing. Get comparison out of your life. And the enemy will lie to you. He will. He'll say, if only you married someone else. Um, And that's the danger of a comparison. Um, It's one of the challenges with people in uh, that, you know, are divorced and remarried. You're always comparing that person to the previous spouse. And, and, you know, it, it is a real challenge. And so the enemy will try and make you feel like you have less. And, and we, in our early days of ministry, we, we loved each other dearly and we loved the Lord and we, we wanted to be happily married. But the pressure of ministry and marriage was really hard. 
So we had to figure out. And then we thought, well, there must be something wrong with us. So we found other married couples in ministry and we asked them, we said, look, what, can we talk to you about this? How do you do marriage, ministry? And then we sat down and they said, well, we fight. And they go, we told them, we fight. And they go, oh, so do we. So what kind of things, <laughs> let me tell you what we fight about. And we were willing to lose face on this stuff. We went, let me tell you what we fight about. I'm a spender, Sharon's a saver. Um, and, you know, I'll make a decision here and Sharon won't agree. And I go, and they, and they just laughed and said, oh, yeah, that's normal. And i got to tell you, we walked out of those appointments feeling like, oh, God, we're not the only ones. See, the enemy wants to lie to you and make you feel like you can't talk to anybody. But we were willing to lose face, talk to people. Um, now, there was an extra pressure on us in one sense. I'm not saying we face more pressure than everybody else. But there was a unique pressure. That's probably a better way of putting it. Because we were called by our pastor in our church, Mr. and Mrs. Perfect. And when you're called Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, and then we know we're not, we felt like, well, who do we talk to? Because everyone thinks we're perfect. So we're trying to live up to an image that was really unfair of our pastor to put that on us. But I understand what he's doing because everything we touched worked. Our youth group, we took it on, had 18 young people, grew to 300. Probably the largest youth group in Sydney and Australia at the time. And, and, and people were getting saved left, right and centre. Um, high schools for us were blowing up. And we were, I guess, you know, um, just going hard at it, weren't we? And, you know, that God was answering prayers and, you know, good things were happening. And I think there was a little bit unfair. It, we put pressure on ourselves because of that, didn't we? So I just want to say that comparison thing, um, don't do it. You know, don't look at someone else's house and think, why don't we live like that? You know, you talked about clothes and the car someone else drives and someone else's marriage. I promise you, they have as many challenges in your marriage, no matter how good it looks. Yeah. I don't care how good it looks. You get to know the real person. Yes. They are dealing with the same stuff you are. Yeah. 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 Um, and kind of just adding on to that too, I think um, a few years ago, you know, Steve and I went through just a hard season in marriage. Mm -hmm. And I remember we talked to this great counsellor who was just wonderful and he said, what is it about life right now that, you know, t tell me, you know, what makes you feel like this isn't good right now? And, I, and we both said, there's no laughter. Yeah. There's no laughter. And it's so funny, when laughter goes out of your home, yeah. it becomes a really hard yeah. place. Yeah. And, so he, and so he was just so great, you know, because I promise you, all of us are going to face stuff in life, hard yeah. stuff. Yeah. And everybody navigates that differently and we're wired emotionally differently. So you might handle something one way, your spouse will handle it another way. So it's figuring all that out. But I remember he said to us, I want you to ask each other, okay, what, you know, like mm -hmm. Steve, what do you need from me right now? And then he said, and Steve, ask, what do, what do you need from me right now? And, it's, and it was amazing when he just kind of put it like that. Yeah. Okay, what? What do I need right now? What, what would help me in this chapter of our life? Yep. And I think that was just a really good tool for us, wasn't it? It was. And it's just like, it, and, and let me just stop, stop and say, there's no shame. In, no. If, if things are challenging, there's no shame in getting professional help. Here tonight, we're talking about it. But if this thing is, you've hit an impasse and you can't figure out a way forward, that actually, we again, we were taught by our pastor... Yeah. Um, I'm going to think about this. I could write a sermon on the mistakes we've learnt right. from our pastors. And I promise you there'll be people writing, you know, about mistakes they've learned right. from me. So yeah. please, I'm not sitting on an ivory tower. Um, but he would say, you don't need professional help. He was, he was against counsellors. And that, that kind of also, now, let me tell you, where that has led him is a very isolated place. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't, he actually dealt with some major trauma in his own life mm -hmm. and because he didn't believe in professional help he didn't get the help he needed and it's biting him today so um why was i going to say that what was i saying um yeah we we not afraid to stick a hand up <laughs> hey we need help we're trying to figure out we want to do life well and there's no shame in that yeah. no problem at all because Matter we want a great marriage so yeah. this is a hard thing that we got to wrestle through but we're going for the other side. You know, there's no plan B in this. It's always plan A. Yep. yep.
Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about priorities because the seasons in life and, you know, maybe right now your season is everything's great. Maybe right now the fruit's falling off in a marriage and you feel like, oh, do you know what I mean? Or maybe you're kind of in this winter and it's just you're just grinding. Um, can I say to you, you will just understand God is with you and you've got to walk through the seasons. David said, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death. One, so let's talk a little bit about priorities for a minute because I think that becomes a real challenge as well, doesn't it? Do you want to start that one off? Sure. I mean, just very practically, Steve is the most important person in my world, as he should be, as your spouse should be. Not our kids. Now, we have adult kids now, so they, you know, have lots of opinions about different things at different times. But, you know, Steve and I have to land on what's right for us at this chapter in our lives. Um, so he is the one I run everything by. He is my confidant. He is up here. Um, and then our kids are, be, you know, come under that. Our family is very important. I believe in family. I believe that God's heart is for family. Um, you know, it's interesting, and I think it's near the last chapter of Genesis. You know, Jacob and Esau yeah. were two brothers that had it out. And Jacob, it's almost like Jacob, the younger brother, ends up, for those of you who know the story, Jacob, the younger brother, ends up getting the birthright and mm. being successful. And Esau, it, it, you know, it, it looks like he loses out. And yet God challenges. This is how I just love God's heart because we all hear about Jacob and he was the line to Jesus and all that wonderful. But in the la I think it's the last chapter of Genesis, God challenges Jacob, mm -hmm. go back to your brother. And this is after years. And it was not a good situation because mom loved Jacob. And, you know, they split this. And Jacob goes, I, I, I can't, if I, if I go, he's, he's, he, I'm dead, you know. And so then he go, God really challenges him again. Nope, you need to go back and make it right with, with your brother. And so he sends all this cattle and whatever. And then Esau hears, my brother's coming. And Esau came out. There's all this cattle. He said, I don't, I don't want the cattle. I don't want the No, no, no. The cattle's coming. The cattle's coming. But the Bible talks about how when Esau saw Jacob, like it makes me cry because I think God thinks enough about family to show reconciliation right there. I believe God's heart is so for our families, not division, not divisiveness, like unity starts in our family. And so I just think our priorities in the, with our marriage, our, our spouse is number one. But raising our kids responsibly to love and care for each other. I remember I had a girlfriend and um, she had four kids. They're a little bit older than mine. She used to say to her kids all the time, oh, look, here comes all your best. Like when she was picking them up from school, here comes all your best friends, like all the siblings. And I just love that attitude about um, yeah. your kids are to, to, be, to have each other's back for the rest of their lives. And, and in that priorities, like what Sharon's saying, I got to tell you, I don't think we always got that one right either. Yeah. I think there were sometimes in the in the when we our kids were younger, I, I I think there's times when I felt I was shortchanged that the kids meant more to Sharon than me, yeah. and I used to say, "Honey, one day they're all going to grow up and leave, mm. but we're going to have to figure out we got to do this together." And there's times when we just didn't agree. Right. Um, I made I said I I need. To actually, I, I understand Sharon needs girl friends and I need guy friends. And and I don't have girlfriends. I have a girlfriend. And I used to, and, but I, Sharon would be mad at me for going to play golf when I have a day off. And I said, honey, I need this. I need to actually get refreshed. I need to come back. I'll be a better husband. And, and we had fights about that. Long, knock down, drag out. <laughs> Fights. Were they really knocked down, drag out? <laughs> I never felt, I never enjoyed the rounds of golf, put it that way. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm a jerk. Uh, oh. But talk, talk a little bit about that as well, because I think we both had to learn to give and take. I, I, Sharon cannot meet all my needs, and I yeah. cannot meet all of Sharon's needs. Right. And, and we had to be really intentional about that, but we also... Um, well, do you want to talk about that? Because no, I want to talk yeah, about something I think, else. I think that's a big part of it is unmet expectations. We expect our spouse to be, 
Well, let me talk for the girls. You know, we inside our little girl heart is a knight in shining armor, you know, that's going to come and gallop us off on a white horse and they all lived happily ever after. Mm. Um, and I think... And I think, you know, as humans, we're just kind of wired selfishly. That's just the way we are. But we're, and so we just put this expectation on you're going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and it's not fair and it's not right. And again, it's asking each other, what do you need from me in this yep. season? How can I mm -hmm. help you set you up to win in this season and yep. vice versa? And I think... Um, I think we wrestled with that because I had differences in what I thought you should be doing and, and the same for him. And now we are this side of it. We go, oh, man, it could have been a whole lot easier if we just yeah. loved each other enough to go, okay, what do you, what do you need right now? What do you need? Yeah. Just stopping, pausing and asking the question. Yeah. Very committed to each other, yeah. deeply in love. But these are the realities of what you do, what you face. Do you know what I mean? And I, I, I remember Sharon and I were one time I was preaching in South Africa and I, I said, honey, I'd love you to come. And we we're able to work it out where she could come. And we went to this, um, this we actually drove out to this safari place, I yeah. guess. And then we got in a four wheel drive or, and, and drove down like really rough terrain to a river. And then we got in a john boat and went along this river and there's all these canvas tents very isolated from everybody else and that was where we were for the next five days but surrounded by mountains and I have never in my life seen Sharon come that alive and I said honey I've never there was a chalet um, that we went to to have meals we went and saw rhinoceros and hippos and elephants and giraffes and it was and, and it could, I love all that. The only problem with me is I want to shoot them all. Um, but it wasn't that kind of a safari. It was like sightseeing. I'm like, get me a rifle. I want to shoot these animals. And, but I'll never forget. I learned something. I don't know how many years we were married when I learned this. And I just really realized Sharon loves the mountains. I said, why are you so happy? I've never seen you this happy. And she goes, I love the mountains. Now, Sharon, I know what she loves. The moment I figured that out, I made sure, and she also loves horse riding. I made sure because she's my priority. I made sure every time we went on a vacation, we went horse riding. Honestly, for years, I hated horse riding, but I love Sharon. So we're going horse riding. But what refreshes me, so I, I realize, I wonder if you know what refreshes your spouse, because I learned that refreshes her. So we always get, so maybe one day when we do retire, and I don't think retire will be what a normal person's retirement will be. I don't think I'll ever really retire. Um, but I think the day we'd love to have a a a, 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 a what's it a cabin house up in Charlottesville somewhere because there's mountains out there. Because we live in Virginia Beach, and I love the water. What refreshes me is the ocean. Actually, I've got a few things that refresh me. I've got hunting refreshes me, motorcycle refreshes me, scuba diving refreshes me, fishing refreshes me, golf refreshes me. And Sharon said to me, you cannot have any more hobbies. But my idea was I'm trying to get a hobby for every season. So in winter, you can't really ride a motorcycle. Um, but I learned something about Sharon then. So we do that all the time. Matter of fact, we went to a dude ranch in Wyoming for 10 days. And, and Sharon can ride. She actually was like, uh, she owned a horse and she grew up with horses. She actually has got trophies of show jumping. And so she gets on a horse. She's comfortable. Me, I'm freaked out. So after this 10-day horse ranch, I went, I really want to invest into Sharon's joy and happiness because she's a priority. I kept trying to do everything. I kept saying to this horse ranch, is there a gun range nearby? Can I rent a Harley Davidson? And there was no, we were the middle of nowhere. And I went, I'm going to be on a horse ranch for 10 days riding horses. And I'm thinking, I remember one time I got just an hour, I got chafed on my butt and I couldn't walk. Um, and I'm like, 10 days. And honestly, after a few days, I said, okay, this is great. But if I'm going to do this for, you know, seven more days, someone better teach me how to ride this horse fast because this is really boring now. And so they put me in a, what do you call it, an arena, I guess. And, 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 and I went, tell me, how do you get this thing to go quick and how do you stay on? And within 20 minutes, I figured it out. And I went, let's go. 
And then they kept saying, Steve, you're going to kill the horse. You have to let the horse rest. And I go, what's, what's wrong with it? Let's go hard. Well, I want to ride everywhere. But and actually, it was one of the most wonderful vacations we ever had. Yeah. yeah. It was. It was. Um, and there's special things when you know what your spouse loves and you work hard to pull it off, you know. Mm. Um, I think, too, we are, I'm, a, I'm a big boundary person. I like boundaries. I operate really good in that. Um, so, you know, and Steve and I, obviously, we're pastors, too. So we, because he is my priority and he is everything to me. I don't ride in a car with someone of the opposite sex. I just don't do it. And he would do the same. I am... And even with social media, I'm telling you guys, yeah. connecting with past whatevers, I'm like, no, not even going near it. I, I, it's just, it's just a, um, you know, the devil just loves to reel us in, you know, yeah. before we know it. Yeah. So I'm not even on. I have a Facebook account. I don't even look at it. Um, and even with social media, I don't DM. Me. I, I'm just really careful yeah. with all that yeah. stuff and I, and I think you know we can trick ourselves into thinking yeah oh, that that won't happen to me I, I can't tell you how many people have sat in our office going I thought that would never happen to yeah. me honestly yeah. so I think they're they're big yeah. things too and well and priorities like for instance you know with my phone Sharon can take my phone anytime mm. she can look at it yes. anytime you want to look at this yeah. it's yours babe you want to look at who I'm texting, who's texting me. And, 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 and I think another priority that's really important to talk about is your kids and the house of God. And I think you've got to get on the same page there. You know, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As a pastor, I've been a pastor 40 years. I cannot tell you how many parents have come to me and said, oh, and I say, hey, where have you been? You haven't been in church lately. Oh, yeah, I've been out here. I've been there on vacation and kids and sports and activities. They're always, and, and like, they're always the parents who are coming to me saying, later, pray for me. My kids aren't walking with the Lord. Well, bring up a child in the way that they shall go. So we had priorities. We wanted our kids to love Jesus. We didn't want them to feel like they had to be in ministry, like preaching ministry like ministry is ministry you understand yeah. if you're in the military that's ministry if you're a chef that's ministry right amen, amen. amen. um amen. and 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 so we just went we just wanted to love god love his house and we wanted them to answer the call that was on their life not the call we tried to put on them and so um but we did say like josh was playing soccer sam was playing soccer sam also played baseball that was the greatest year of my life um the most depressing year after that because Josh talked him out of that. And and Alyssa was a cheerleader. And, and so we got fully engaged in our kids, but we also made sure church was a priority. Now, hear me. We want to make sure they love God's house. We didn't want them just to love the Lord and love us. And we also taught them if any of them ever, ever spoke, you know, rudely or harshly to Sharon, I'd go, and Josh, you'll remember this. Come here, buddy. See that girl over there? That's my girlfriend. One day you're going to grow up and go, I'm with her for life. You ever talk to her like that again? And this is not a popular thing in today's culture. I will see to it. You will regret that on the seat of your pants. <laughs> and you will not sit down. And, and, and teaching them how to honour their mother. Now, don't get me wrong. They weren't bad kids, but... Here's the thought. Here's the script. Those who have, how many have got younger kids? Let me see. Okay, listen to this scripture, please. It's the best scripture I can give you. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Do you know what that means? They're bound to do some foolish things. But the rod of correction will drive it far from them. Never, ever discipline, what's the right word? Spank a child when you're angry. Never do that. Use the timeout option. It's not always, you don't always have to go to spank. Amen. But I do believe in biblical format of a spank. I know it's not popular. I know it's not. But you don't, And by the way, if you start doing that and your kids are like 10, 11, it's too late. It's either if you start that when they're just very little or that horse is bolted, you've got to find other ways. So would you agree? Yeah, totally. And I think, um, you know, what's what we worked really hard to do was be the same person here as we were at home. 
And I think that's a big thing. If we're coming to church and if we're worshiping Jesus and doing all that and, and saying all that, but then when we get home, if it's just like chaos and everybody's angry at each other, our kids just get really confused. So again, I, I'm, I'm not, because look, I, I know, I remember having little kids and they can push you to the edge and you're like, listen, I am going to, you know. <laughs> I, I, I remember getting to those moments and those little guys, they, they just know how to, don't they, you know? And it's like, yeah, if you don't let up. Um, but it's so important that we are who we say we are. Yeah. I, th I think that's the most confusing thing for kids is if we are saying we're one thing and we're acting and doing something else. So how do we raise kids that love Jesus and want to be in his house. A big part of it is, you know, I, I think for, a, you know, that's what we talk, we would talk about how much we love the church. And, you know, I was thinking back when we got saved as teenagers, um, some of y'all would remember the whole James Dobson. You remember James Dobson? Focus on the family. Focus on the family. And, and I remember as an 18 year old, after church on a Sunday, our church would play focus on the family. Now I was 18. I, maybe 17. I, mean, I don't even know if I'd met you yet. So you, but I just yeah. remember thinking, I want a great family. And I remember sitting, like I feel like I'm sitting here today because of those investments too. You know yeah. what I mean? I just think whatever you can do to get around yeah. and hear, what, is, what does God's word say? What, is, what does the word say about what our family should be like? And I'm indebted to focus on the family. Mm -hmm. But I watched as an 18-year-old before I even was thinking about having children. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I believe that's what, the, the church is a village. I was with Joe today, and as I left, I said, well, I'm, I'm just part of your village, Joe. We're the village, we're the church. We're here to walk you through this season. And that's what we're all here for. That's what mm -hmm. the church is here for. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, just on that too, just, just priorities. Sharon is my greatest priority. Mm. She is. And she knows, she knows that. And in our life, if she felt like I was getting too distracted with ministry, preaching, pastoring, or playing, and she go, she, there's a scripture in Colossians, I love it. It says, um, Paul says, I pray for you that you be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Be and listen to what he says, bearing fruit in every good work. Mm. And so Sharon knows I am committed to our, our family and to our marriage. And she could pull me up at any time and say, Steve, you're not around enough. Or when you're here, you're not here, here. And right now, you need to spend more time with Sam. You need to spend more time with Alyssa. And if she said that, she know that would stop me in my tracks. Um, and I'm that guy. I'm, I am not a, I'm not a a big celebrator. I'm a task-driven person. So I, I have a vision for something, I go after it, and I work, I, nothing else matters except that. I'm a laser-focused, you know, psh, I, I'm going hard. Sometimes I've realised I've gone so far behind when I turn around, I have nowhere, Sharon's nowhere in sight. Mm. And I had to slow down sometimes and smell the roses I had to celebrate. She she has permission to put the brakes on me. And she would go, and, and so the scripture is bearing fruit in every good work. So what are the good works that we all have in common? Number one is our spiritual life. When you think that's an area that we ought to be bearing fruit in. Okay. Number two is our family life. Would you agree? That's a, that's a, we all have that in common. We want to bear fruit in that, don't we? And, and number three, I think it would be, you know, church life, spiritual life. And these are not in order of priority, and I'll mention that in a minute because I think they're all equally important, which may shock some people to hear me that I would say that. I don't think when you do this, God, family, church, I think you're setting family and church up to become enemies of each other because if you're doing church time and, and all of a sudden now, you know, the family's going, well, this is church time. And then you're doing family time. That Then the family time, you can start resenting the church or you can start resenting family. But if you do what Joshua said, as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. 
I'm making a decision for my family. We love God. We love his house. And Sharon knows I'm committed to bearing fruit in every good work. And so what matters is spiritual life, church life, family life. I'm committed to bearing fruit. Now, if you got a really good spiritual life going and really good church life going, but you have poor family life, this is what some people do. Well, I'm going to pull out a church life to get family life right. Well, now you've brought church life down to where family life was and you got family life up and it's, that's not got the – Paul says, I pray for you that you be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, that you bear fruit in every good work. In other words, it's possible to do all these things at the same time. You just got to be willing to figure out which one needs attention right now. Does that make sense? So if it's family, without sacrificing my spiritual life, without sacrificing church life, I got to bring family up. Does that make sense? So we're talking about priorities. So Sharon, would, would you agree? Uh, Any time and every time she's pulled me up on it. Now, you've got to realize I'm that guy. I will go hard. I, I have two speeds. I have hurricane or I'm asleep. And there is nothing else in between. I just had an MRI done just recently, and the girl said to me, now, you know, she, she knew who I was, and she goes, Pastor Kelly, are you going to be okay? Are you claustrophobic? I said, no, your only problem is you put me in that machine, there's a very good chance I'll fall asleep. And I literally did. She thought I died. She's shaking my leg. Pastor Kelly, Pastor Kelly, and she woke me up, and she went, I thought you died because I'm either going hard or I'm asleep. Yeah. If I sit down, I will fall asleep. True? And it's true, an ugly very sleep. True. Yes, very true. So, so here, so let's just go through the priorities. Ready for this? They, they're all priorities. Number one, our, and again, I'm not saying number one in the sense of priority. I'm saying they're all priorities. It's not a descending. Okay, spiritual life. Would you agree that's probably the most important thing we can all have? And by the way, there's a scripture for this. If you're wondering, I just gave you Colossians 1, bearing fruit in every good work. But Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor of God, favor of man. His mind, 12 years old. His intellect was increasing, stature, his character was increasing, his physical being was increasing, his physical development, favour of God, spiritual life, favour of man, social life, all at the age of 12 at the same time. Right. So here's the thought. Number one, let's get a spiritual life bearing fruit. That's Would you agree? Number two, let's get family life bearing fruit. Number three, let's get our church life bearing fruit. Number four, our financial life bearing fruit. And number five, our social life, bearing fruit. And so there's times when I go, and there's seasons where I'm going, okay, right now I don't have much of, of a social life, but it's a season. And we'll ride this out because I'm busy with work or something else going on. Make sense? When I was working back in Hillsong Church, I was literally working 16, 18 hour days for three months. And uh, I ended up getting viral meningitis and almost died um, because I was just going too hard. And Sharon goes, Steve, you're never home. I said, honey, I know, but I've got to graduate this Bible college. I've got to get nation builders, these church plants around the world going. I've got to get all the end of year budgets and financial management reports. I've got to write all of next year's financial plans. And we are going to hire more staff, but that's not till next year. And right now I'm doing 90% of church business and administration, and it's just going to be a busy season. The moment I came off that and had a vacation, I got a simple cold and my immune system went, oh, we stopped. So guess what stopped with it? My immune system. And a little virus that normally we'd get in your throat and you get a cough or a sneeze went straight to my brain. And I was sick. I was in total darkness for about six weeks. And, and, and it was the sickest I've ever been in my life. Um, and that was not a good season. And that was not bearing fruit. But I knew there was going to be life light at the end of the tunnel. So there are seasons – well, you've got to say, this is going to be busy right now, right. but I'm committed to bearing fruit in every good work. Is that okay? Yeah. Does that make sense? So, and, and so what you do is you rate those things from one to five. One means it's not good at all. Five means it's great. And so I wonder if you were to rate yourselves, yourselves individually, what would you rate your marriage right now? Is it a five or is it a one or is it a two? Is it a three? And what you do is you rate spiritual life. How is your spiritual life? For me, I would honestly rate my spiritual life right now. I think I could be more intentional in my prayer times, but I'd probably rate my spiritual life in the Word. I'd probably rate it a four. You know what I mean? So that's bearing fruit. Wouldn't you agree? 
Okay, physical life, I can finally praise God, say that I can rate my physical physical life as a five. I'm in the gym four days a week for an hour and 20 minutes. I've never felt healthier. I've never felt stronger in my life. I've been doing it for a year and a half. That was always something I'd give myself a one or a two, to be honest with. Um, you know, financially, how you're managing your finances, you know, but that will put pressure on a marriage. Woohoo, man. So we went, okay, we, we came to an agreement. We're going to get rid of our debts. We're going to just believe, you know, in, in a couple more years, we'll have paid off our mortgage. And we actually said we're going to agree. No credit card debts. We agree. Um, we pay cash for our toys. And sometimes I hate that because I'm an impulsive person. I want it now. I don't like delaying gratification. But we have priorities. We want to bear fruit in their financial life. So does that help? Look at those things. Rate yourself on those things. And if you got a one, don't bring the five down to a two to get the one up to a three. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's bearing fruit in every good work. That was a long set. I didn't mean to go that long. That's but it's good stuff, isn't it? It's very good. Mm. Yeah. And then you want to close out on while we have a uh, coffee just break? Just on priorities, it's um, just trying to understand your spouse a little bit too. Um uh, years ago, actually, when we first arrived in the States, someone recommended a book. It's called The Birth Order Book. And I think it's a, there's a revised edition. I hate that book. The, 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 <laughs> the New Birth Order Book by a guy called Dr. Kevin Lehman, a Christian psychologist. And um, it was a great read. I, I haven't read it since. Um, but it kind of says that there's nuances to birth order. Mm. He says things like, most presidents of the United States have been firstborns. Most comedians are youngestborns. Um, so so just, just some little things. And then um, middle children, he actually, he actually, you know, the middle child syndrome, he says middle kids usually do better than the others in life because they've bounced up against the older and bounced against the younger and they've done a lot of bouncing. It set them up for life. But, That's um, me. But they um, also say they tend to march to a different beat, a little rebellious. That's me. And their peers are very important to them, yeah. middle-born children. So Steve is middle-born. He's right in the middle. He's number three of five. And friends are very important to him. If you, if you know anything about Steve, he has a ton of friends. That was really hard for me. You know, there was a time when I'm like, what about, you know, uh, hello, you know. And I've had to learn that that is a part of who he is. He has a capacity for friends. I, I don't. I'm a firstborn. I'm a rule follower. I just like it nice and neat and, you know, whatever. Um, but again, priorities, your spouse is number one. It, it, it's not just, oh, yeah, you're here. It's no, finding out and understanding and learning about who they are mm -hmm. so that you can go, you know what? I get that you need a lot of friends or, you know, and you, you have this capacity. So how, how can we make that work? Mm -hmm. And I actually think that Steve has taught me a lot about what a good friend is. And, and so I've learned so much from just going, wow, I really admire that about you. The thing that I hated about you initially, because it can, it honestly can feel like a bit of a competition, yeah. you know, it can. And it's like, oh, wow, where am I in this equation? But again, it's conversation and then going, oh, I get that about you mm. now. And also another big thing in priorities and learning about your spouse is family of origin. And I don't have a, you know, we, maybe we can get into more of that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. where you come from, has a massive influence in even where you are. Well, we're 60 years old this year. Our family of origin still raises its head in our lives right now. So, so interesting. It is. And here's the thing I want to say for those of you, how many of you are first generation Christians? Let me see. How many first generation Christians? And it was your family before you didn't know the Lord. You're the first in your family, first generation. Okay. So Cheryl and I are first generation Christians. So my mother and father were alcoholics. You probably heard me tell that, you, that story a million times. Um, hers weren't. Hers were, uh, I don't know how to describe them, Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, if there is such a thing. Um, and, and Sharon would get home every day and dinner would be ready and she would do her homework and then have dinner, watch a little bit of TV and then go to bed. Not me. No, no, no. I'm out in the pub. I'm in the bars. I'm 13 years old. And I'm out with my brothers. We're getting blind drunk. We're doing things we shouldn't do. Um, first time I ever brought Sharon over to the house, 
I had to warn my brothers, if you come out of your bedrooms naked, I will kill you. Because they would love to do that. That was the Kelly house. It was a crazy, crazy house. Um, and so, and 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 because, and, and I didn't think people like Sharon existed. And God put us together and says, now work this out. So our biggest challenge in early married days, I'd come home from work before Sharon because I started work before she did. And the house is empty. I'm used to noise. I'm used to, our house was a frat house. So yeah. well, like I'd come home and there's no one home. So what do I do? Ring up all my friends in youth group. Come on over. Let's play table tennis. Let's play ping pong. Let's hang out. And Sharon would come home and see all these people at, in her house. And she would sit. I didn't know this. She would sit on the curb and cry. She didn't want to deal with, she wanted me. And yeah. she's used to a family well, origin. I want peace and quiet, really. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I was coming home to chaos. And, and, and I'll never forget because if I would come home at 2, 3 in the morning, I, my mother would get up and make all, me and all my friends bacon and eggs. So I'm going, when Sharon comes home, I go, hey, hun, can you make everybody some food? And Sharon would go, no. And she, she'd go into the bedroom and I'd be so angry at her because I'm trying to get her to be my mother. And I'm going, what is wrong with you? You're very selfish and inconsiderate. <laughs> And then yeah. friendly. And she goes, you're the selfish, <laughs> inconsiderate one. And it really was in the early part of oh, our yeah. marriage. Oh, man. We are a testimony of the grace of God. That's we really are. <laughs> <laughs> we loved each other, wanted to stay married, but we weren't sure how we were going to do it. Because yeah. we were just, and that's family origin. That's all I'm trying to say. And you have no idea how much, and still to this day, family origin comes out, doesn't it? <laughs> 